just doing a short video here based on either videos that other people have done on the YouTube or comments I've received in response to previous videos and I they're both linked by a theme of criticism of idealism and uh, I'll be dealing with what I think is a, a terrible waste of time which is the influence of Hegelian idealism on the left and then the influence of platonic idealism within computing. Now why bother? You'd have thought Hegel and Plato are long dead. Do they have any influence? Now it's 183 years roughly since Marx and Engels lambasted Hegelianism in their book The German Ideology. But for some reason, or for a number of reasons, uh, leftists still think it's necessary, necessary to study him. And on the other topic, it, it's around 85 years since Turing put computation on a materialist footing. But notions deriving from platonic idealism still tend to distract computing science. Now, this guy, Taimur, Taimur Rahman, is an excellent communist educator and propagandist in Pakistan, and he's written a great book on the class structure of Pakistan. And he has lectures on Marxism and philosophy. And by the tradition of the left. He feels he has to give lectures on Hegel and they're competent lectures on Hegel. Um, but I really don't think that these lectures are a good idea. Sorry, not that his lectures are a good I aren't a good idea, but I don't think it's a good idea to spend time on this. Uh, far from being a, a help to people, I think that the ideas they come across in these old works, these pre-materialist works, are a hindrance to intellectual development. The whole edifice is the most awful mysticism and speculation. The, the concepts that uh, he was explaining in his lecture, like being nothingness and essence, really have no part whatsoever in a scientific materialist explanation of reality. Um, they're not ideas that are relied on in any of the contemporary sciences. There aren't any essences. Althusser makes a big point of being an anti-essentialist in philosophy, but it's even more obvious in the context of biology than in the context of history which he was applying it to. Biologists don't think there is such a thing as an essence. We don't think there is an essence of cat or an essence of oak tree that makes cats catty and oak trees tree-like. What it is is that they have common genetic codes and the relationship between species is not something imposed on the species by us recognising them. It's a, something that really exists in the degree of shared or different, different genetic codes they have. Now why, why do people talk about essences? Uh, it was before people knew what the material processes giving rise to biological forms were. Idealist philosophers speculated that there was such a thing as essence. Um, but the, the forms that living things take and the, their relationships come down to actual configurations of atoms and comparative shared sequences in related, sequ in related species. Another mistaken idea is the notion 
take an oath from Hegel that there is a logic of nature. There isn't a logic of nature. It's, it's a misleading idea. Logic can only occur when you have patterns of matter that are so configured that they perform logical operations like conjunction, disjunction, negation, etc. And it can be done by various electrical and mechanical devices. Me giving you this video is intimately dependent on there being electrical and mechanical devices that perform logic. For example, I give the simplest possible logic gate really that you can come up with. Here is a, a NOR function, how you would make it out of uh, transistors. You've got a couple of transistors here. When you get a positive charge on either A or B, it, these are pass transistors and that, that a positive charge on A allows a current to flow down to, to ground here. So if A is positive, the out thing becomes low. If A is negative and B is negative, both of these are blocked off and the resistor pulls the out signal high. And that gives you a NOR gate. It's not either A high or B high. Now that's using NMOS transistors which are now out of date because they use too much power. The drain, the, the pull-up resistor here is constantly um, allowing power to be drawn. So you don't uh, use those now. But I've, I've given the simpler design of a, a gate for, 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 for explanatory purposes. And of course before people could build them out of transistors, they built them out of relays in, in telephone exchanges and the early work on uh, applying logic to circuits was based on the assumption that they were using uh, relays. But logic also occurs within cells at enzymatic levels. You get feedback relationships within cells. This is a, an example of a feedback relationship in a cell which effectively implements an exclusive or relationship. And uh, the it, it's an exclusive or relationship is operated on on the dependent on the level of glucose and lactate. Now this kind of, of logic processing exists because it's advantage um, advantageous to the evolutional survival of organisms to be able to react to their environment. If they're going to do that they must process information and this can either be done at, at a low level enzymatic level within a cell or it can be approximated in we can approximate what neurons do in terms of uh, logical act activities. So logic can also be done by neural networks in nervous systems. And we know that human beings can be trained to do logical deduction. But they can only do this because there's a basic information processing ability in their nervous system which they can make use of to do this logical deduction. But even there, is it really meaningful to say that there's a logic in nature? Are neural nets logical operations? Well, to a limited extent you can do that, but you can say that. But it's a very crude approximation to what nerve cells do. It's more realistic to understand what nerve cells do in terms of um, matrix and vector multiplication run logic. Uh, typical nerve cell symbolically represented here. These are the inputs, there's an output, and what a nerve cell does is it weighs up the inputs by, mathematically we represent this as multiplying a weight by the activation on the input, summing it all out, which gets an activation level in the cell and we then 
if we're mathematically modeling this, we put it through a sigma function, which causes it to be either firing or not firing at the end of it. So to an extent, you can say it's logic, but it's, it's something more sophisticated, really. I really can't think of any instances in which a useful understanding of any real process can be well modelled with the sort of abstraction that Hegel employs. We've got so many more tools to look at the world that have been developed in the last couple of hundred years that to go back to the 1820s would be a terrible retrograde step. The great danger is that if you do that, young people's minds get stuck in a time warp. You educate them in their 20s with concepts from the 1820s. And they go on employing modes of thought that have long since been abandoned in science. They, you cut them off from the threads of intellectual development that have led to the modern scientific world. I mean, just about the only useful thing conceptually in the lecture on Hegel that Timor gave is the, the, the slogan that to determine is to negate. And now that, that can be made more profound and you get some leftists citing this in Latin saying determino es negato. But there's nothing very specific about Hegel this. This is something every high school student learns about these days when they cover set theory and Venn diagrams. It's the same basic idea that if you define a set, you are defining the complement of the set. And everyone understands that who's been to school and has been taught these diagrams. The diagrams make it clear and easy to understand. Um, you don't have to go back to old philosophers on this. Now, who should you, if you were really wanting to focus on some historical background, who should you look at? To my mind, you, you, you should start with Lucretius and then you move on to, to the, the, the 19th century atomists like Maxwell and Boltzmann. And from then on, you trace down concepts in Boltzmann through Shannon, Crick and Watson because it's the understanding of information and what information is that transformed science in the latter half of the 20th century and obviously you should any person who wants to be a materialist should read Darwin as well and if you want to actually concentrate on on logic you'd be better to read the people who really have influenced logic, like Bull, Russell and Turing. And perhaps if you're more adventurous, go and read David Deutsch, whose paper on the universal quantum computer introduced the topic of quantum computing and is really a resolutely materialist and physicalist take on why mathematics is possible. Now, talking about why mathematics is possible, let's get to turn to the influence of Platonism. I have a video on Turing's universal computer. And this still of it gave rise to a question. Um, someone said they didn't exactly get it why I don't consider the universal Turing machine and the Lambda calculus. To be equivalent. Now, just for a moment, lambda calculus is in a sense an outgrowth of the development of the theory of logic as it had reached in the 1920s. The question is understandable because if you do first or second year computing courses, you're taught that lambda calculus and universal digital computers are equivalent. So in what sense are they not equivalent? For those of you who have not done any computing courses, the Lambda Calculus was a logic notation or simple programming language, you can think of it, 
as that was invented by Alonzo Church in the 1930s. Um, it was a programming language before there were computer hardware available. And it later provided the conceptual basis for the programming language Lisp, which was developed in the 1950s. And from Lisp, a whole series of functional programming language is, were later developed. And if we take that case here, the whole thing is based on the practice of the logicians of the time, which was to take variables and substitute them into formula. And he, Church is saying, OK, we can do a lot of computation this way. And if we take this lambda formula here, it says lambda x such that uh, the value is x plus 1, apply that to 2. And what that says, take 2, put it into the parameter x, substitute it in here. So what you've got in there becomes 2 plus 1. And obviously the answer is 3. Now in the video, I dem said you can demonstrate the, the difference between the two by an experiment. Uh, you can put the formula for the lambda calculus on top of a book about the lambda calculus and come back in the morning and there's no answer. If I type the lambda calculus into a tiny um, box here called the lambda can, which has the lambda calculus programmed into a, a microprocessor chip, it comes out and prints the answer. Now, what does it mean to say two things are equivalent in this case? An ideal, there's an ideal or idealist sense in which the lambda calculus and the UTC are equivalent, in that if a function can be computed by a lambda calculus, the function can be translated into a form that the universal digital computer can also compute and vice versa. But from a material standpoint, these two things are very different indeed. The lambda calculus itself can't compute anything. It's only useful when you have the, a lambda calculus interpreter running on an actual computer, in which case it's not the lambda calculus that does the actual calculation. The lambda calculus is a virtual machine running on a real machine that does the actual work. Now, if you go back to the 1930s, the actual computer on which the lambda calculus was running would be a person, a mathematician, who had learned the rules of the lambda calculus and who has a sheet of paper on which to work it out. And indeed, when Turing was working in the 1930s, the word computer didn't refer to a piece of hardware, it referred to a person who did computation. The difference between that and the Turing machine is that Turing machines can be built. Now, the actual um, hardware that Turing proposed in his initial ideas in 1937 was very sketchy and would have been relatively hard to implement, but he refined those ideas and actually built machines in the 40s. So Turing was going to goes down to a lower level than Church. Church relied on there being a human computer to do the actual work. And Turing was saying, what does a mathematician do when they apply any calculus? And he then says, OK, we'll propose some kind of machine that does the essential steps that a human being does. And he comes up with something much more general than Church. Since once you build a machine and supply it with energy, it can do any calculations, including you can program it with a list in, Lisp interpreter, which essentially makes it uh, able to interpret lambda calculus. But the difference is that Turing forces us to face material limits. It forces you to consider computation as a material, not an ideal process. And actually, if you're a computer designer, you're preoccupied with very material considerations. You're preoccupied with minimizing power use. You're preoccupied with disposing of waste heat, with ventilation. Uh, you're preoccupied with where can you put wires 
in three-dimensional space in order to transmit information from one part of the computer to another. Now, none of that is made clear to you if you're thinking at the level of the lambda calculus. When you start off from Turing's standpoint, you move on to see that there are material limits to computation over and above the purely logical limits to computability. This is something that um, Greg Michelson and I deal with in our book, The Limits to Computation. There are limits to, to, to speed in addition to the limits, the logical limits that uh, Turing and Church could point out. The, the limits to speed are essentially thermodynamic. They are developed by the physicist Landauer. And if you approach the thing from the standpoint of lambda calculus, rather than the standpoint of building a machine, none of this is apparent. And this can lead you astray, because the idealist abstractions of the lambda calculus have in the past led to serious diversions of effort, uh, tens of millions of pounds in Britain, by Platonist computer scientists. During the 1980s, the British government was very worried that the Japanese were going to take a, a world lead in advanced computation. And they spent a huge program to try and bring Britain up to the level of the Japanese. And because of the influence of Platonists, drawn from mathematics who'd moved into computer science in Britain, most of that effort went into building what were essentially complicated machines to run the lambda calculus. And they thought that these would allow a high level of parallelism because if you just look at a lambda calculus expression, it's in principle possible to evaluate the arguments of a pure functional language in, in parallel. And this approach was held to hold great promise and, and would enable Britain to leapfrog over the Japanese. They built, there were a couple of projects to build such machines. One was called GRIP and one was called ALICE. The ALICE one had a lot of um, investment in it and uh, they installed one at the Artificial Intelligence Institute in Edinburgh and it had a hundred processors 132-bit processors all collaborating um, to run the lam uh, a functional language, M ML in that case. Greg and I were able to access it and benchmark it and discovered that it actually performed worse when running a functional language than when we took that and ran it on a single processor made by a small competing firm that actually started out with um, how to build a decent von Neumann machine. Uh, the whole effort was a complete waste. Now, why was that? It's because if you approach the thing from the standpoint of the lambda calculus, you don't think of what's actually beneath. Actual parallel performance is constrained by the ability to transmit data, the bandwidth of channels and similar considerations like that. The ideal functional independence of parameters that lambda calculus languages have plays a very small part. Since the lambda calculus languages run as a virtual machine on top of a physical machine, and it's concentrating on the parallel physical machine that enables you to make advances. And the whole project of uh, functional languages as a route to parallelism died a death on this account. It was because it was idealist, not materialist. It was a complete red herring. If you look at a modern high-end server, there's a, a, a modern server with um, four 28 core Xeons. Now, what do you notice about that? It's pumping out heat at a huge rate. And the, a major constraint is, firstly, how can we get rid of all that heat? Now that, so they have all these fans. In addition, the major concern of the people building it is how can we get enough bandwidth 
on the channels between the different um, CPUs in order to minimize the waste of time um, caused by waiting for data to arrive from one of the other CPUs. It's those material considerations that determine whether you can achieve high levels of parallelism, not the abstractions. In the end, it's the geometry of 3D space within which you build computers and within which information must be transmitted and heat dissipated that imposes 